4, Exodus chapter 4, let's read verses 22 and 23. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. I'd like to preach tonight on the Lord of Pharaoh. The Lord of Pharaoh. Now we know that God is the God of Abraham, the God of, uh, of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Uh, we know him as our God, the, 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 the God of the Christians. But also understand that he is the Lord of the Pharaoh. Now Pharaoh was a pagan king. Pa Pharaoh did not obey God. God even hardened Pharaoh's heart against him. But still he was Lord over Pharaoh. Pharaoh was completely in God's hands no matter what Pharaoh thought, no matter what Pharaoh did, no matter what Pharaoh said, he was under the lordship of our God, Jehovah. Now, God was preparing Moses to go in to speak to Pharaoh. And as we said this morning, that, that Moses had some objections to his call. And probably most of us, when God tells us to do something, uh, we look at all the reasons why we can't do it, why it won't work, and uh, perhaps try to look for some sort of avenue for our escape. But all of those things that we know, uh, God had an answer for Moses. God has an answer for us, and God will enable us, God will use us, and God will make us fruitful in his hand. We will be successful in whatever we do that God would have us to do. And he was commanding Moses some things that he would say to Pharaoh. Let's look at the voice of God at this time. God spoke with imperial authority. He claims his people. Now he said in this passage, he called Israel my son. My son. Uh, something we don't, terminology we don't usually hear concerning a nation. Uh, but what he was saying is Israel is my own. Israel is my inheritance. Israel are my people. Israel had, for some extent, I believe, uh, or just to some extent, had forgotten God. Somewhere in this chapter, I believe, it talks about how they had forgotten the name Jehovah. Perhaps they were caught up in all the cares and all the burdens, and we spoke about the burdens this morning that they were under. We're under burdens too. Life has its burdens. Uh, Ever since Adam sinned and Eve, or, and, and, and along with Eve, and they were cast out of the garden, part of our life is always going to be bur burdens. The Bible said a man's life is full of troubles. Still doesn't stop us from complaining about it, does it? Still doesn't stop us from being surprised when trouble comes to our door. But God has told us that. But with imperial authority, he claims us as his children. He makes the call. It wasn't Israel's decision to be his children. He had already made that decision before any of these children were ever born. Before they ever went into Egypt, before their forefathers came along, he had already claimed them as his sons. Now what a great thing to be considered. A son of God. What a, 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 a magnificent proclamation that can be made about us. We sing that song, A Child of the King. Too many times we're living like paupers. Too many times we're estranged from our father. What a wonderful thing to know that you're a child of the king. Uh, what a wonderful thing to know that he will never disown you, never dismiss you, never forsake you, never put you away. As he speaks, 
The voice of God claims you as his child. What a magnificent thing. Um, Sister Pi was talking on the, on the way home from work, to, uh, or work, on the way home from church today. Um, and she was talking about listening to the radio and, and, and hearing a couple of guys talk. And they were discussing uh, election and they were trying to find fault and trying to bring verses out that, that uh, uh, disprove the election, the sovereignty of God. And she said, well, this isn't for me. And she turned the channel over and she found Adrian Rogers' voice. Yeah. And uh, I love Adrian Rogers' preaching, but one thing that he never did get right to his dying day was the sovereignty of God. He called what we believe hyper-Calvinism. He said it was a deadly doctrine. He didn't fully understand. Many times he would preach what he would call Calvinism, when he would preach the gospel not realizing it. But she turned it over to them and he was preaching against the election of God. And people find that offensive. I find nothing offensive in the fact that an almighty, all-powerful, all-wise, all-knowing God looked down on humanity and chose me not because I was good, not because I was righteous, not because I was deserving, just because he is a loving God. Amen. What a beautiful thing that I never had to earn his love, that I never had to deserve his love, that I never had to live up to his love. Could you imagine if our salvation depended on us living up to his love? Or even, as they say, making a decision. They'll say, oh, we're unworthy. Uh, uh, they'll, they'll sing those songs about uh, how, how he died for such a worm as I and, and a wretch like me. And they'll use those words, worms and wretch. But they really think that there was something inside of them that was good enough, that was smart enough, that was righteous enough to, loot, to choose God. God looked down upon Israel. as they were in the dirt, as they were in the mud, as they were in slavery, as they were in poverty, uh, uh, as they had no hope, he looked down upon them and he says, there is my son. There is my son that I love them enough. Pharaoh, if you harm them, if you will not let them go, I will take your son. And sure enough, he did. You know, we, we claim the promises of God. We, we're, we're so happy uh, to claim the promises of God. We're, we're, we're glad to claim the promise of salvation that he promised us. We're glad to claim the uh, eternal life in heaven. We're glad to, to claim that he's, he's uh, uh, promised that he would never leave us, that he would never forsake us, that he would watch over us, that he would take care. We're glad of those promises, but God has also promised the unrighteous some things. He's promised them hell. He's promised them punishment. He's promised them an eternity of burning. Those are also God's promises. God made his promises of love to his people, but he made a promise to Pharaoh as well. A promise concerning death. He speaks with imperial authority. He speaks with bare assertion. He calls for them. He calls for his children. He doesn't let his children just go wandering. He doesn't let his children go scattered. He doesn't uh, allow his children to stay in prison, to stay in bondage, to stay in slavery. He calls them out. He said, let my son go. Let my son go. He speaks to the world. And he says, let my son go. No longer will they be in bondage to you. No longer will they be a slave to their human nature. No longer will they be a slave to your world system. No longer will they be in domination by you. He speaks to the devil himself. He says, leave them alone. You've got no claim over them. These are my children. 
You can make no charge against them. You can make no assertion against them. You have no power over them. They are mine. Let them go. He speaks with extraordinary absoluteness. He commands them. Why did he claim and why did he call for us to be let go? Why did he call for us to be set free? What is our purpose in all this? He said, let my son go that he may serve me. That's our business. Our job is to eat Jesus himself. When they found him in the temple at 12 years old, he said, I must be about my father's business. Is he the only begotten son of God? We as children of God should have make that same statement. We must be about our father's business. Sometimes we let our personal lives interfere with our, our father's business. Sometimes we let our families interfere with our father's business. Sometimes we let our jobs, our burdens, our desires even Now, I told you a long time ago about a, a, a song that one of the guys I used to sing with used to sing to I Shall Not Be Moved. And part of that song was uh, uh, complaining about the preacher and complaining, hoping he didn't pray, uh, preach too long because Bonanza was on tonight. And we, we look at that with some sort of humor, but there's people that have that attitude. I got to get home to watch my, my, my program. I got other things to do once I get out of here. Now, there are some things that are important. Don't get me wrong. Jesus, concerning the Sabbath, said, uh, if your, your uh, uh, ox has fallen into the ditch, wouldn't you stop on the Sabbath and get that ox out of the ditch? There are times of emergency when we need to do what we have to do. But sometimes we make our own emergencies. Sometimes we give things preeminence that don't necessarily have to have preeminence. If somebody came in here and, and told me that something happened to one of my family members in the, in, in the middle of the service, I'm sure I would run out of here and go see what was wrong with them. But our reason for existing is to serve God. All things were made by him and for him, according to the scriptures. We see the voice of God. We see the voice of man also in here. You might say, why didn't God just... And wouldn't this be more effective as a matter of fact? Why didn't God just go to Pharaoh? Instead of going out to Midian, miles away from Pharaoh, miles away from Egypt, miles away from the land of Goshen where the people were enslaved, why didn't God just appear to Pharaoh and say, let my people go? Why did he choose to go to Moses rather than Pharaoh? Now here's something really deep. Listen to this. The reason why he went to Moses instead of Pharaoh is because he wanted to. Because he wanted to. He's God and he does things the way he wants to. Why does he use the foolishness of preaching? Why does he use a, a, a tongue-tied individual like myself to preach the gospel? Why does he call men and women like you to go out and share the gospel with every creature? Why doesn't he just go and speak to them himself in private revelation? Because God has chosen the foolish things to confound the wise. God has chosen the foolish things. God has chosen the foolishness of preaching to get his word out, to get his message out. 
And what a blessing that is. That God would use me. Years ago, I, I thought about how my mom and dad, when I was little, how they would let me help them do some task. It would be easier for them to do it themselves. I got in the way many, many times, and they could have easily done it more quickly and more efficiently without me and probably done a better job if I wasn't there hindering their work. But because they loved me and they wanted to teach me and they wanted to make me a part of what they were doing, they allowed me to do it. They allowed me to take part in that. What a great thing that God has allowed us to take part in the salvation of souls. God does the saving. Jesus died on the cross. The Holy Spirit goes and speaks to them. God does the saving. Salvation is of the Lord. And out of His love and His generosity for us, He allows us to take part in that. And then He rewards us when it's all said and done. He does it all. And He rewards us for it. You talk about a loving God. And we can't mess it up because he's going to save who he's going to save. He's going to have mercy on who he's going to have mercy. He's going to have compassion on who he's going to have compassion. God is going to save who he's going to save. We can't mess it up any more than we can mess up something that our parents are overseeing and making sure that we do it right. We can't mess it up, but God has chosen us to be the instruments of his message. Today, we're preaching on Moses. God didn't need Moses. Today, Moses is revered by Jews and Christians alike because of his faithfulness, because of the things that he accomplished through the power of God. God didn't need Moses for anything. He didn't need Moses to go to the Red Sea or to go to, to, to uh, Egypt. He didn't need Moses to for the plagues. He didn't need Moses to bring water from the rock. He didn't bring, need Moses to open the Red Sea and to close the Red Sea. He didn't need Moses to deliver the Ten Commandments. He didn't need Moses for anything. But God in His love and His mercy and His, his, his compassion towards us allows us faulty instruments to be used to make beautiful music. I saw a video last week of some guy that picked up some uh, uh, toy guitar in Walmart. And uh, somebody was videotaping and He just started playing this song like he was using the greatest instrument in the world out of this little toy guitar. If a man can take a toy guitar and make beautiful music, what do you think God Almighty can do with us? The voice of man is the instrument of God's message. The voice of man is infallible when he preaches under the authority of God's word. There is great power, and I can preach with great confidence when I preach God's word. Now, every once in a while, I'll get up here and I'll have to admit, I don't know. I, I really don't understand this or, 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 you know, this. I say, well, this is what I think, but I could be wrong. But what a great thing to know that you know that you know and to be able to preach the truth. I can preach to you today that if you will call upon the name of the Lord, trusting in Him, you will surely be saved. I can preach that on the authority of God's Word. I can preach to you that there is a reward in heaven for all of His children. I can preach to you that He's coming back. Moses could go to Pharaoh and say exactly what God told him to say, but not because Moses thought it might happen, not because it was Moses' opinion, not because Moses even necessarily wanted it to happen, but because God told him to say it. I can be wrong about some things, but God's word is never wrong. As long as I preach this book, I can preach with authority. The voice of man is very powerful when he preaches under the authority of God's word. Then the voice of man always also spoke 
on the insistence of God's command. Just as he had to preach freedom for the people of Israel, he also preached condemnation to the firstborn of Egypt. It's one thing to get up here, and it's a, it's, it's a delight to get up here and preach about salvation. Boy, if I could just preach about salvation every message and, and preach about heaven and, and preach about God's love toward us and preach John 3.16 every single time I got an opportunity to preach, I'd be happy with that. But I also have to preach the other side of the coin. One of the criticisms of men like Osteen is he only preaches the goodness of God. He says that he knows that there's a hell, that he believes that there's a hell, but that's just not something he wants to preach on. I saw a thing, I've, heard, I've talked to you before, some of you may have seen some of these things, the Babylon Bee. It's a, it's a fake page that, that offers fake news stories and it involves Christians and churches and things like that. And it talked about, uh, last week I saw one, it was the Joel Osteen Study Bible. And it had, I forget how many notes it said, but all of them just said, believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. That's the message the world is preaching. Brother Don spoke in his, his, his uh, uh, prayer about false teachers and, and praying for these people and praying for these churches that, that are being sucked into these false doctrines. Just as sure as there are a heaven that we need to yearn for, there is a hell that we need to shine. There is a hell that we need to warn people about. The voice of one crying in the wilderness said repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand in this passage we also see the vicariance of illustration you like that word vicariance I'm not sure that's even a word I made that up We talked somewhat at some length uh, last week about Moses being a type of Christ. How he was an unexpected savior. The world wasn't looking for him. His people weren't looking for him. How he came as a baby, was hidden away from the rest of the world. The rest of the world didn't see him, didn't know about him. But his mother delivered him, put him more or less in the tomb. There in that basket. Left him there to die. And he was pulled out. Pulled out to be the savior of his people. We talked about he, how he was a shepherd. And how he shepherded the flock. Not only the flock there in Midian, but the flock of God's people that he led through the wilderness. We talked about how he delivered the law. And Christ fulfilled that law. We could not fulfill that law. The law was given to us to show us that we could not fulfill that law. We have to look to the one who did fulfill, law, fulfill the law, Jesus Christ. Moses went down to be our intercessor. Then we see his brother. Aaron. I believe that we can look at Aaron and look at the type of the Holy Spirit. Moses went down and he did his signs and he did his miracles and did all these things by the power of God. But the scripture here says in Exodus chapter 4, And Moses and Aaron went and gathered the, uh, together all the elders of the children of Israel, and Aaron spake all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs of, uh, in the sight of people. And the people believed and they heard when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and they looked upon their affliction. 
Then they bowed their heads and worshiped. Moses brought the power of God to the people. And Aaron brought the word of God to the people. He spoke. The Holy Spirit takes the power of God. And he speaks to your heart. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would testify of him. Now all these things that people are saying the Holy Spirit is making them do nowadays, that's nonsense. You know what the Holy Spirit does? The Holy Spirit preaches the word of God. That's what the Holy Spirit, he testifies of Jesus Christ. The fruits of the Spirit are not laughing and giggling and speaking in strange tongues and rolling around on the floor and jumping up and down. The fruits of the Spirit are meekness and temperance and patience and love. Holiness. God sent his son to do the work that he commanded him to do. To go into the world and to die for our sins. And then he sent his spirit to go and to preach to our hearts and to make us new creatures. Then finally I'd like to talk about the power of God. The power of God. When, when, when the voice of God spoke and spoke with authority, he spoke, there was power behind that voice. That he was, had the ability, that he was going to accomplish everything he set out to accomplish. He was the power behind Moses. Before God called Moses from that burning bush that we preached on this morning, before he called him out there and told him to go and do these great things, Moses was hiding. Moses was scared. Moses was power, uh, powerless to do anything for himself but hide and try to preserve himself. But the power behind Moses drove him back to Egypt. Drove him to speak the message to Pharaoh. To, drove him to be able to accomplish all these things. The ten plagues, the Red Sea, the, the, uh, the, the water from the rock. Everything that you can mention that Moses accomplished. God was the power behind Moses. He had the power to do his will. Skip over a chapter or two to Exodus chapter 1. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. Here was Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world. We look at all these powerful leaders. We look about and we, we, we see the maniac that's in Iran. We see the, the, the president that was in power for eight years. We see a new president coming in. We, we, we hear about uh, Putin over in Russia. Uh, uh, tonight, even as I'm preaching, uh, uh, the prime minister of Israel was supposed to be being interviewed on 60 Minutes. All these men are in power because God has put them where they are. God has raised them up. They are completely in his power. Pharaoh with all his horses. Pharaoh with all his chariots. Pharaoh with all his warriors. Pharaoh with the entire power of Egypt behind him was nothing. God said not only... Is he going to let my people go? He is going to rush to do it. He's going to run them out as quickly as he can get rid of them. He made it so, didn't he? He made it so. Pharaoh, the night that he lost his son, commanded those people 
to get out of his country. Don't hesitate. Don't run. Don't look back. Get, I mean, don't, don't, don't walk. Run. Get out of here. God said he was going to do that. God still has the power to do and to control. God still reigns. God has the power to choose his people. As I said, some people find that offensive. And these men that, that Sister Pi was talking about that were trying to uh, show verses, and I said, you know, you don't have to listen to these people too long before you see the flaws in their logic and, and the holes in what they're saying. Somebody argue with this. Romans chapter 9, verse 14 through 23. Well, let's back up a little bit. Let's read, let, let's read this whole thing. Uh, the whole chapter 9 concerns the adoption of election. It talks about, in verse 7, God chose Isaac. It says, In Isaac shall thy seed be called. Not Ishmael, not any of the other sons of Abraham. He chose Isaac. When they had doubted and Sarah was well up in age and Abraham was well up in age, God had promised them that Isaac would be the one. Then Rebekah and Isaac had two sons. God chose the younger over the older. Verse 13, it says, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we then say? Is there unrighteousness with God? For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then is it not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even this, for this same person, purpose, I raise thee up that I might show my power in thee. And that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he hath, will have mercy, and on whom he will, he hardeneth. Thou wilt say unto, then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who doth resist his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou to repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay? of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared? unto glory. God being God has the power to choose his sons, his people. Paul knew that there would be a rejection of this just as these people on the radio are rejecting this doctrine today. Would you not rather choose the goodness of God or believe and trust in the goodness of God rather than the goodness of men to come to Him and repent? Who would be saved if it was not for the sovereignty of God? God is Lord over Pharaoh and God is Lord over me. Amen. Would you stand?